This is the Secrets of Influence series, where we are talking to uh, visionary entrepreneurs and CEOs all about the power of influence. And this is, of course, uh, off the back of my book, Secrets of Influence, which you can now get on Amazon. And with us in the hot seat today is Jennifer Kenning. She is the founder and CEO of Align Impact. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, man. Yeah, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. So um, why don't you kick us off with the, the elevator pitch, uh, Jennifer? What are you guys doing over there at Align Impact? We are investing capital for profit so the world works for all 8 billion people and the planet. So what types of investments are you guys making there? Every asset class, both public markets and private markets, really focused, I would say, on really three key themes. One is climate, two is economic development, and three is social and racial justice. We believe that all of these themes are actually intertwined and that the power of capital to really eradicate the issues of our times is unparalleled to anything else that we have at our disposal. Mm. So what's the backstory to this uh, Aligned Impact journey that you've been on? It's a good one. I'll give you the shorter version, and then if you want me to expand, uh, you can press on me. But uh, the short version is, is that I started my career in wealth management family office, was doing traditional investing, and was severely depressed in my 20s. As I was climbing the corporate ladder, I realized that something was missing. And so I worked, started working with homeless people in Los Angeles. And as I worked with people on the streets and started to see their struggles, how the systems really weren't set up to meet them where they are and to empower them, I really started to come alive myself and find my own purpose. And so I started this research project over 15 years ago around why are the systems broken and how do we actually fix the systems and landed on that we needed to use all forms of capital to really fix the system, not just philanthropic capital or government capital, but we really needed private capital to play a critical role. Um, and that is when I landed on impact investing. And so I started hmm. weaving it into my prior practice at my prior firm. And not only did I come alive, but my clients started to come alive as well. So why are the systems broken? I'm always, you know, I was literally on a, I was being interviewed this morning um, and I was talking about uh, systems, weirdly. Um, and I was saying that it's funny how when you when you recognize that the entire world and all its shapes and forms is literally driven through systems, then you if you don't see that, you kind of like, ah, you, the, you're always that effect, you're never at cause. Uh, but when you see that there's systems, you know, systems for everything, systems for social media, car manufacturing, you know, uh, social injustice, you know, whatever. The racism is a whole system on its own. Um, and so when you see the world through the lens of systems, then you can start to change them. So just to double click on that idea, why are the systems as you see it, like not fit, you know what I'm saying? Like for, yeah, like absolutely. why are they creating this problem? Yeah. I think it's really threefold. Um, one is, I think that each person in the system is actually working in their own silo rather than actually how do we work together? So mm. we're really a silos based economy or a silos based kind of ecosystem when we need to be interconnected. So that's number one. Number two is that um, we aren't incentivized to actually work together to use our talents, our resources in a way that really directly goes at the problem, which leads to number three. A lot of our systems are designed to create either more efficiencies, productivity, uh, to solve something at a surface level. When what you and I are actually talking about here is really how do we eradicate issues, which means mm. we need to go to the root cause of the issue. So we're not mm. simply just moving things around. We're actually simply looking at this system no longer works in society after 80 to 100 years. It needs to be completely rebuilt and reimagined. Mm. Um, and how do we do that? Right. So if you think mm. about a lot of our systems and if you think about civilizations that have rose and fall, fallen over the last 100, 200 plus years, it really does come back to reimagining systems to get mm. to the root of the issue, to design systems today that actually work so that everyone can thrive. Mm. Yeah, it's a powerful idea. Right. It's funny enough, I actually write about I call them influence systems in my book. 
because I believe like you never just, you know, rise the level of your ambitions. You always gravitate down towards your systems. I don't even fuck what it is that you're trying to do. Um, and so curious though, to unpack from your perspective, because obviously, you know, you, you doing private placements, you're investing in these, uh, in these companies that have this promise to change systems. Right. So what do you look for? I mean, is it the typical, cause you, I mean, I spoke to like 60 odd general partners of VC firms in the U S last year. And if you, if you ask that question, you kind of get the same thing, you know, well, big Tam, you know what I mean? Great team, blah, blah. Um, and you see the same formula all the time. However, in your case, it seems to me like it's actually less about, you know, getting a 20, 20 X multiple back on your investment. It's more about like impact, right. Or influence. So curious, like, what do you like now look for Jennifer when it comes to, you know, investing or not? Yeah. First, let me dispel, like we are still aiming for market rate returns because we do believe that you don't have to sacrifice returns in order to invest this way. So think of everything you've heard from those 60 other GPs. We take all of that criteria just as seriously. And I look at that more as a financial and operational risk assessment. Then on top of that, we're looking for three additional things. One is what is the macro environment that we're trying to solve for? Right? So we're really looking at problems that exist today and we're looking ahead. A lot of the financial markets look backwards. What does history mm. tell us? What have, what have returns been in the past? Right? No returns in the future are not predictive of what they've been in the past. Um, we're looking to say, what do we need to do today around climate or climate resilience or climate justice that will not only work in 2030, but will work in 2050? And what investments do we need to make today for that to be reality in 2030? So we're really looking at it from that impact slash solving the problem perspective. The second piece is what's the macro environment? right? So what is the macro nature of the problem we're trying to solve? And then is this the right environment in which to solve it, right? So if you think about um, affordable housing today is going to be a lot more attractive than commercial real estate, just because of where we are in a macro environment. And then lastly, it's what are the risk factors that we actually believe impact returns that are not actually factored into traditional underwriting. So think of that as what are the externalities that are costing society that aren't factored into un traditional underwriting? We're adding those into the equation, right? Hmm. We can keep producing at the way we're producing, but at some point it's going to bankrupt us, hmm. right? The planet only has a finite amount of resources. It can only sustain a certain level of this intensity, right? So we're factoring in that that actually uh, has a material factor on performance uh, in the long term. Hmm. How important is market timing for you? Like the timing of things? I think it's less important in what we do because we're taking such a long game. The game we're playing is a 10, 20, 50 year game. It's not a quarter to quarter game. And I think that's hard where we sit because we're in traditional markets, because we are used to pricing certain things day in and day out or by quarter. And so people get really focused on what the short term results are. But if we really think of what our core mission is, which is that the world works for 8 billion people and growing and the planet, we have to take a much longer time horizon. And so I think it's less of a factor in the work that we do. We have to be patient. We have to be very thoughtful. 99% of what we look at isn't going to pass our due diligence process. And I would mm. argue that that's the same as the traditional markets. Most of what yeah. people see, they're not going to invest in. It's not investment caliber or quality. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me... Um... I was looking at uh, just on your website here and you've got, uh, you know, your sort of a vision statement. You, you, you envision a world that works for all humanity, 7.8 billion people on the planet. Curious to understand from your perspective, like what is influence? Like how do you def personally define it? Influence is using, in my perspective, is using your skills, talents, resources to drive something bigger than yourself or something mm. for the collective, right? So I believe in my role in that vision statement 
is to lead other leaders and managers and people. And that's a lot of different people from clients to vendors, to people on our team, to GPs, to LPs towards that vision and the role that they get to play in that vision. Right. Mm. It can't, we can't accomplish that. No one person can do that alone. That mm. actually requires systems that requires a collective group of people driving in the same direction that mm. requires the influence of people saying the we is as is so much more important than the me or the I. So how do you story sell this idea? Right. Because it's pretty interesting. I mean, you, you're kind of like off center from all the other guys I would suggest. <clears throat> Yet your story is pretty awesome, right? I mean, you're, you're genuinely trying to um, elevate others, which is how I, in a very simple way, define what influence is. You're not trying, it's not like um, you're trying to enrich yourself. You know what I'm saying? Like you're not an, a, a typical VC firm. It's like, I just want to get a return on, uh, for, my G, for my LPs. You know what I mean? You're actually genuinely trying to do that, but also to leave the world in a better place, which for me is the definition of influence. So, um. So how much of, of your personal vision for this company falls into this uh, sort of narrative of influence? Meaning if you were to sell your story, when you tell your story, like how are you doing that? Because it's, it's, it's a rich story, isn't it? Great question. I would say I'm doing it in two ways. One is asking people what their why is. So what's one thing you want to move the needle on in the world and why? And people often say, well, I, I want to move the needle on a lot of things. I can only pick one. And my answer is yes, because you have a finite amount of time and a finite amount of resources. And if we each picked one thing that we were really passionate about, that we were willing to like wake up and we were willing to lay it on the line for, the world would look different. Mm. So I get them engaged in like what's possible and have it be their aha moment. No one's interested in getting engaged in my story and my why, right? Mm -hmm. They want to they figure it out for themselves. Second is, is then educating them on all the different ways that they get to do that, that they may not have seen before. So it's not me saying there's only one way to do it. It's not a prescription. It's, hey, you have seven different levers you could pull. What's one actionable item that really inspires you that you could do today mm. that would get you on that path? It's so different than let's build your financial plan and then let's go make 20% returns and then let's make a ton of money and give it away in the second half of our life. That's an old score. <laughs> it's an old game. It's an old mm. scoreboard. No one's interested. There's a lot of people especially millennials and Gen Zers that are not interested in that game. It's, it's, it's difficult to, um, in Did general, people find it difficult to choose. Like if you said to them, you know, hang your hats on this one thing, like what's your why? Um, it's hard to figure it out because, you know, if you're a visionary like you are uh, and like I am and like many others are, we're always, you know, romanced by the new shiny thing. So, if, if you then you go like we'll put a gun to your head choose this is the what like what's your why do you know what i mean like it's like well my my, my why is looking at the shiny stuff <laughs> well your why can change over time yes exactly okay so your why does shift i think so when i mm. first started my why was that everyone had equal opportunity to have access to economic development right that it was very human focused right teach them to fish Give them a hand up, not a handout. Really empower the systems to work for people and let people have one shot, at least, at having an equal playing field and making it in this life. Today, my why is still very much that, but I would absolutely factor in climate justice. I would absolutely factor in that what we do around the planet is super impactful to people and vice versa. If you had asked me 15 years ago, I would have said, leave the planet and climate to this climate scientist and all the people doing that. And I'll just focus on what I'm doing today. I can't do what I'm doing without factoring in mother earth mm. and the people. So I do think my job in having people find their own narrative in their why is asking questions 
that allow them to discover what's possible for themselves and what's possible inside of a greater conversation. Mm. So for example, if you say I have, my why is a shiny object. Tell me a few shiny objects that you've gotten excited about over the last few years and why have you gotten excited about them? There's <laughs> lots there. I just keep peeling back. Lots of people often say you're really good at asking questions because mm -hmm. really what my job is, is to get you engaged at a different level and to ask you questions to explore for yourself yeah. that has you think at a deeper level and has you connect at a deeper level. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing, right? It's, uh, it's, it's great that uh, I'm meeting a kindred spirit that asks better questions because it's kind of like, I wrote about this in my first book. I was like, I don't think we actually realize just how much questions govern our lives. You know what I mean? Yeah, like they're sure. sitting there. They're sitting there in the unconscious, aren't they? Most of the times, obviously, it's conscious, but there's this like, it's like, am I good enough? You know, whatever. Like there's, there's questions that we're asking ourselves every day that I think dictate where we go. You know what I'm saying? Like if you go left or right, or maybe you go straight up, you know what I'm saying? Um, and we, I actually almost think that we don't actually ask enough que or the right questions. Do you know what I mean? We kind of fall into this paradigm of thinking where it's like, well, I'm only ever going to ask these sorts of questions about myself because that's what I believe I am. Uh, but if you want to go and change the world, you have to basically ask different questions, don't you? I mean, so I think if you ask bigger ones, uh, in other words, if you, it's like, how, what if, or how, it, is it possible to, do you know what I mean? Or how would it be possible? You know, what would that look like? Um, and so it's this idea of, I suppose, just asking better questions, right? Just to get yeah. a better compass. My second question behind, if you could only move the needle on one thing and why, what would it be? Is, do you come from a place of abundance or scarcity? Because if you come from a place of scarcity, I have a lot of work to do to get you to where we're trying to go. Because if mm. you come from scarcity, then it means you believe that we have scarce resources, scarce amount of time, scarce amount of opportunities. You believe that you win at the expense of me losing. You believe we're playing a finite game. If you come from a place of abundance, you believe that there's enough to go around. We actually have enough resources. We just don't allocate them out correctly. Yeah. If you come from a place of abundance, you believe that we both can win and that actually us both winning with a lot of other people is actually the answer. Yeah. Right? The game that most people are playing is an old game. Mm. In order for me to get ahead, you ha I have to put you down. That's true, right? Right. So, yeah. I think, how do you get to your why? So the one, one thing I have used before is something called laddering. So I was a uh, head of strategy for Ogilvy in, in uh, Africa at one point, in another life. And, I share uh, that in common too. But oh, you Africa do? The, you... No, not Ogilvy, but Africa. Oh. And like, oh. I definitely lived oh, yeah, there yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah you did. I've been to the continent over 15 times. It's definitely yeah, man. a happy place. It inspires a lot of my personal work. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So like, okay, exactly. So if you're going to put together some kind of massive strategy where the millions are going to be spent, right? So you have to have a like an insight. And so uh, to your point around why, like figuring out the why, uh, is called laddering. So if you basically just, if you like, you know, why do you do the map round show? Well, I want to make a difference. Okay. So why, why do you want to make a difference? Well, because I want to leave the world in a better place. Why do you want to leave the world in a better place? You see what I'm saying? So you, the, you're peeling away the layers of the, of the onion, right? What's your advice to someone, you know, like a CEO or a visionary that's kind of struggling with this idea of like mission? You know, what's your advice to him or her around how to figure that shit out? Because it's almost like it's like a, it's languaging, right, around something. Um, what's your advice to someone in that is kind of struggling with, well, I don't know what, I don't know what it is. So usually I would go about asking a bunch of questions. I'd start with, who do you want to be in five years? Who do you want to be in three years? Who do you want to be in one year? Who are you today that has you not be in alignment with that? Then it was, why do you want to be whatever you want to be? So my goal is not to make a ton of money. My why is that I leave this firm that it'll be here in 30, 50, 100 years, that no one will know who I was. Who was that co-founder? Co in 10, they may not know who I am. 
That's a much bigger legacy. Why? Because think of all the generations that will come after us and that they get to live inside of a different type of firm that's doing different things on the planet. So I'd ask any CEO, why do you do what you do today? Is that going to be relevant in three to five years? You know this, Matt, like technology and the advancements of society, things are obsolete in three to five years. Mm. You have to be way far out ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. Right? What are you doing today that you're not going to have to do in three to five years? Because mm -hmm. it's not going to be needed anymore. Think about if we asked ourselves that question in 2019, ahead of COVID, ahead of AI, ahead of two wars that we're currently facing inside of right now. Like, what if we asked ourselves that question five years ago? Because now 2019 is five years ago. Yeah. That's, again, goes back to the questions, isn't it? <laughs> and I don't think, I don't come into conversations, meetings, keynotes, wherever I'm in yeah. dialogue with like the answer. Mm. I'm actively listening to you and I'm talking from my thoughts, my intuition, what I really believe. Mm. Right. So I don't yeah. come in with the questions. If you come to a dinner party at my house, which you will, because you live in Colorado, um, where I live, um, you come to my dinner parties. I ask mm -hmm. one to three really hard questions. There are no side conversations happening. People know don't come to a dinner party if you're not willing to go deep and have a really frank, honest conversation. Hmm. I feel like you need to be a podcast host. <laughs> In my next lifetime. <laughs> I'll leave that to you. <laughs> So tell me, um, Jennifer, what's, what's in, you know, in the context of influence and, and we landed the idea, didn't we, around, uh, you know, influence of really about elevating others and so on. So when you think about, you know, this idea of influence being the currency of, of business leadership, like modern business leadership, what sorts of qualities do you, you know, do you think are, are important to, um, are important to, to have? as a leader today, like, you know, to really influence people, get the best out of them, reach their potential, like whatever your languaging is, like what sorts of qualities do you think matter today for the future leaders? Great question. Uh, one is I think you have to be very empathetic, which is different than compassionate in my, my view, mm. right? I have to really understand where they're coming from. And I have to deeply have authentic and be empathetic. You can't pretend to be empathetic. You People spot that. Mm. Number two is that you have to constantly be developing yourself as a leader. You're only a leader if people want to follow you. Otherwise, you're a dictator or some other type of person. When mm. people want to follow you, you're a leader. So in order to be a great leader, you have to constantly be doing the work to be a great leader. And then three is you have to have your own point of view, right? You have to be willing to have the stakes be high. And you're like, I know what I'm focused on and where I'm going and why I'm going there. Mm. It's not someone else's vision, right? It's my job to, you know, empower people to really shift society, but they're going to do the heavy lifting, mm. right? I'm the one that's like grounding them in the why and then championing them in doing it. That's the other thing. Leaders are there to champion people. They're not there to champion themselves. It should be lonely at the top. It should be not full of accolades because you're championing other people. Mm. Right. My yeah, job as a woman leader is to champion other women and yeah. men, but is to really showcase that you don't have to do it the way it's always been done. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, right? Because I think as some leaders, I'm not saying all of them, but some leaders, what they they like do a whole bunch of work, right? They do something that someone else couldn't do. And then the members of their team get the credits and then they get pissed off. 
do, do you know what I mean? Where it should be like, well, you just, that's the point, <laughs> isn't it? Like, that's the point. That's, that is the entire point is to elevate others and allow them the credit so that they can feel like they, they you know, they can generate that sort of, you know, internal momentum or confidence that they can do it. Do you know what I'm saying? Even if you yep. did it and you don't get the credit, so what? Well, I think that's when you move from being a small for organization or company to scaling, right? As the founder, co-founder, I wore a lot of hats. I still wear a lot of hats, mm. right? But it's not my job to score the goals. It's Thank not you. my job to be the defensive coordinator. It's my job to either be the coach or in the owner's box, mm. championing from a different vantage point which then I work on this every day. I have to give up control. You have to give up the spotlight. You have to really look forward and say like, I have a different role than I had when I was building the company. And I think a lot of founders struggle with that. That's why a lot of founders tend to not be the people that scale their companies. They can take it so far and then they have to bring in someone else to scale it. Yeah, some ridiculous stats about that, see? Or something like, 50%, like half minimum, like at least half um, of uh, founders that get into some level of scale, like they get replaced, it's like goodbye. <laughs> you didn't have the skills, bro. Sorry yeah. for you, you know. And I understand that also, like I think oftentimes, I mean, you, you don't, uh, so, like I think you have to know like what type of founder you are, you know, because if you are the type who really digs big, you know, and can have a thousand employees or whatever, um, and you like that culture and that sort of corporate end game, you know what I mean? Because it is a corporate thing at that point. Then great. I hate that. Like I don't. I'm never ever gonna do that. Like fuck that. I'm never doing that. Like I, <laughs> I had 75 people in my previous business, and I was like, well, you know what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm going to not slit my wrists tomorrow morning because it's fucking horrible dealing with the, the the people culture stuff and the performance management and all that it's like i'd rather and i and, and i actually had came up with this thing called um, the team lunch rule so i want a big business but a small team and if uh, if i can't have the whole company at my house for lunch is too many people you know? i love that i also think people complete leadership with management mm. So I just read how to be a great boss. And what I discovered is I actually don't want to be a manager anymore. I want to be a leader. I mm -hmm. want to be the visionary that I am. I want to lead leaders. Mm -hmm. I want to make great managers. I don't want to be a manager. I'm not a great yeah. people manager from a day-to-day no. -day management perspective. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So how are you going to make that happen then? I mean, like, what, what do you, when you look at 2024, we're obviously, you know, beginning of the year, what sort of um, things come to mind for you when it comes to you, you want to grow leaders, like lead leaders, like, how are you going to do that? Like, what do you think? Is there something that you do every day anyway? Or is it like other things you have planned? I think I do it every day just by developing myself as a leader. Like, I don't think you can just read a leadership book or go to a class and then you're like, I'm done. Like I'm constantly reading, constantly going to the next evolution for me as a human being and as a leader. I'd say the three things that I'm implementing, one is instead of delegating tasks, I want to delegate outcomes. There's a huge difference. My managers can delegate tasks. I want to delegate outcomes to the people that can make those outcomes be way better than I'm going to make them because they're, they're in their roles for a reason. Number two is communication, right? Communicating effectively with clear, defined expectations with by when and how you're going to be held responsible. If you ask me, do I think I'm good at management and accountability? I'd say, no, that's my next frontier to work on, mm. right? Is holding people accountable because there is some element to me that wants to be liked and nice and not so tough. I'm already a tough person. I already think big. I think fast. I go fast. I'm loud. I'm intimidating to a lot of people. I know that about myself, right? So it's like, mm. 
I want to be respected, not liked. I want to be hold people accountable. It's something I work with my coach on a lot. And then the third thing that I'm really focused on, which might throw you through a curveball, but I'm going to say it anyways, is I'm really working on grief. Grief? Grief, because I'm moving from one chapter of building the company to the next of scaling it. Mm. There's a lot of grief in there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of grief in my personal and professional life that I've never dealt with. That I think that if I actually confronted it, which I've been doing over the last couple of weeks and I'll do into the really into the first quarter. I'm excited for who I can be not only as a leader, but as a human being, as a daughter, as a friend, as a aunt, as a sister, as a boss. And it's similar to the conversation I was having 15 years ago around depression. It's the next evolution. Like, We've made grief this thing that's like a faux pas, like keep that over there. That's negative. Like a lot of things I'm going through as a leader is grieving what was to step into what is. Mm. So it's deeply spiritual and deeply, it's a hard work. Yeah. It's the hard work, right? It's the work that uh, no one likes to do. Um, but I hear what you're saying. I mean, like I, I spoke to Bo Burlingham and he's, he was like the editor for Inc. And he wrote, uh, I don't know if you know who he is, but he wrote uh, Finish Big, Small Giants, um, just a really cool dude. And um, you talk about your thing, right? Like these stages of business, right? Like it's the startup phase and then there's the scale up and then there's mature and you know, whatever. So basically he interviewed 300 guys who had sold, his, sold their businesses. And... Um, Something like 90% of them go into depression afterwards because of this fucking grief thing. It's like, well, I'm rich, but my life sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I have no structure. You know? I don't yeah, know exactly. me. <laughs> like, no one needs me anymore. What am I supposed to do with my time? Fuck. Uh, <laughs> the holy grail while we're building so, it. We're know, like, oh, I want more time. Thing, but I hear you, you know, and I think you have to process these things. Um and uh it's uh, it's and it's work that everybody should like i'm a big believer in therapy like go speak to a therapist man go and talk to someone that isn't stuck inside your own kool-aid bottle you know yeah. um i'm the same and, but i'm more coaching because i've learned in my 20s i went to therapy for my severe depression yeah um what got me out of it was working with homeless people seeing myself through their eyes and seeing how how i wasn't grateful for my own life and all the privileges that i have Mm. Um, so I'm a big coaching person because I like to be on the court. I like to be in action. I like someone like kicking my butt, essentially, like go figure it out. Get out of your own way versus mm -hmm. let's talk about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, uh, you got to get your own system figured out, man. You know, yeah. whether that's a coach or therapy or a friend or a mastermind or, a all of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly i mean once you're on the train jennifer you might as well go all in you know what i'm saying <laughs> for sure it's like the onion keep feeling it back there's more to there get go, dude. what are you gonna find when there's no onion left <laughs> some other new thing like i don't envision that i'm gonna get to some plateau and put my legs over the plateau and be like i made it <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there's I just gonna you. just be a new mountain to climb like you, um, there'll be a new shiny object, a new company I want to build, a new passion that I have. Yeah, no, I understand. Tell me, uh, Jennifer, let's wrap this up. If there was like a secret of influence that you feel, you know, based on your experience, you feel other leaders should be aware of, like, what is that secret of influence? Be curious about others and really listen. Hmm. Because then you get to do all the things we've just talked about. Mm. They feel seen and heard and they want to open up. It gets to a different level. Mm. Then you can actually start a dialogue and exchange, have an exchange between two human beings. Kind of like this. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Telling you, you need your own show. <laughs> All right, you'll be the first person I call when I decide I have my own show. Ah, uh, don't call me. Call someone. I'll else. have you be my first. I'll, you'll be one of my first uh, people on the show. Yes.
All right. <laughs> well, Jennifer, thanks so much for the uh, for the time, man. Appreciate you. And um, yeah, just you know, I love what you're doing. I think it's awesome. It's needed. It's different. Uh, and those are those are things that I value. So, wishing you and the rest of the team there at Align Impact all the best for 24 and beyond. Okay.